Section 14 of Some Famous Women by Louise Creighton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 10 Isabella Bird, afterwards Mrs. Bishop, Part 2. Miss Bird was now alone in the world, but she had a devoted friend in Dr. Bishop, who had for some years attended her sister and was with her in her last illness. He had several times asked Miss Bird to marry him, but she had always said that her heart was given to her sister. Now, in her loneliness, he repeated his request, and she at last consented, and they were married in the spring after her sister's death. She was fifty, ten years older than her husband. He promised that when the need of travel awoke in her, she should go to whatever end of the earth beckoned to her. He used to say that the only rival he had in her heart was the high tableland of Central Asia. As it turned out, she never left him for long. He became ill soon after their marriage and was almost a complete invalid till his death five years afterwards. Dr. Bishop was a man of noble character, and Mrs. Bishop was devoted to him and mourned him all her life. She was now altogether alone except for her friends, and there was no one to keep her from the long and dangerous journeys in wild countries which she loved. She, who was always ill when in civilized countries, often spending weeks on her sofa because of pains in her back, seemed to be able to endure anything when she was travelling and leading a wild, free life. One thing that helped her was that she was able to eat anything. Dr. Bishop said that she had the appetite of a tiger and the digestion of an ostrich. At first, after her husband's death, she busied herself with bringing out her books of travel and with caring for the poor people amongst whom her sister had worked. She also wished to learn nursing and spent three months in London in the surgical wards of a hospital. Dr. Bishop had been much interested in medical missions, and she decided to found a mission hospital in his memory. It was nearly three years after his death when she started on her next long journey, going first to India and on to Kashmir, where she thought of founding her hospital. In her early days, Mrs. Bishop had felt no interest in missions. Indeed, she rather disliked them. She thought it a mistake to interfere with the ways and beliefs of other people, and on her travels used to try to avoid mission houses. Dr. Bishop's influence had changed her opinion by first giving her an interest in medical missions. What she saw afterwards in eastern countries turned her into a warm friend of all Christian missions. She made great friends with Dr. Neve, the medical missionary of the Church Missionary Society in Kashmir, and with him arranged for the building of the John Bishop Memorial Hospital at Islamabad. It was a great pleasure to her that Dr. Neve had been a student under her husband. When this was settled, she was glad to escape from the crowds of Anglo-Indians who haunted Kashmir and whose hubbub she found intolerable, for a ride of twenty-eight days through the Himalayas to Lesser Tibet as far as Leh, travelling alone with native servants and camping out at night. When she got back to India, she found it possible to carry out a long-cherished plan and make a journey into Persia. Before she started, she visited several mission stations and founded another hospital in memory of her sister called the Henrietta Bird Hospital, which also was under the care of an old pupil of her husband's. The journey through Persia began at Baghdad and lasted nearly a year. The first part lay through wild, lonely mountains where no English lady had ever been. Here she had the companionship of an English officer who was travelling for scientific purposes. It was an awful journey, and she would never have undertaken it had she known the hardships she would have to face the long marches, the wretched food, the abominable accommodation, the brutal barbarism of the people. The weather was terrible, ceaseless rain or deep snow in the high mountains. The nights had to be spent in cold, filthy caravanserais, as the rough inns of the east are called. Mere shelters, 
which three or four hundred mules and their drivers often shared with mrs bishop's party there was constant danger from robbers and everywhere curious crowds surrounded her allowing her no rest or peace they used to feel and pull her hair to finger all her things and examine her clothes when she hung them up at night they brought their sick in crowds to her to be healed one evening when she had got a mud hobble to herself and was suffering from a severe chill lying down covered with blankets she heard a noise and looking up saw the room thronged with men women and children covered with sores and suffering from all kinds of diseases she had to get up and listen for two hours to their tales of suffering interpreted to her by her servant it was painful indeed to be able to do but little for them the next morning they were all there again she could only give them ointments for their sores lotions for their eyes or some few simple medicines and had to send most of them sadly away the cold was so bitter and the storm so terrible in crossing the mountains that it was a wonder that mrs bishop and her whole party did not perish she felt that they would never have got through had it not been for the splendid arab horses which carried them with unfailing spirit through all the difficult places forty-six days brought them to teheran one of the chief cities of persia and here she rested in comfort for three weeks in the house of the english minister and then they started for another and longer journey of exploration among the mountains again terrible hardships and dangers were endured every day after the fatigues of the journey diseased and infirm people crowded her camp and she did all she could to help them one of the chiefs came to her one day for medicine and as he lingered watching her care for the people he asked her why she took so much trouble for people unknown to her she answered by telling him through her interpreter the story of jesus christ when he had heard what she had to say he said sadly he is the hakim doctor for us send us such a one as he was these people are mohammedans and seeing the little help and comfort their religion gave to them and the miserable lives to which it condemned their women made mrs bishop still more keen about christian missions in the larger towns she often visited the houses of the chiefs and went into the women's quarters where the many wives of the chief and his children lived shut up together they were never allowed to go out and spent their days in quarrelling eating sweetmeats and dressing and dyeing their hair they asked her for love potions and charms and wondered why she did not dye her hair and for what purpose she could be travelling for the last part of her journey mrs bishop was quite alone with her servants as the english officer had to go elsewhere her chief companion was the arab horse on which she rode which she called boy and which was as gentle and affectionate as a child he often slept in her tent and would come and rub his nose against her face to attract her attention he carried her safely from bergerid in the centre of persia to trebizond on the shores of the black sea a journey of four months in dangers and hardships her courage never failed she was robbed of most of her travelling necessaries and had to do without them as she could not replace them she had strange food and often had to do without food at all and yet she got safely through though she was a small delicate woman fifty-nine years of age in all she travelled twenty-five hundred miles since she started on her journey through persia wherever there were mission stations she enjoyed the hospitality of the missionaries and she was much impressed by their self-denying work the last part of her journey was through armenia where she saw with much sympathy the courage and endurance of the christian armenians poor ignorant people who clung to their ancient faith in spite of cruel persecution they begged her to send them teachers for their own priests were poor and ignorant because they could not afford to go away to study one of the priests said to her beseech for a teacher to come and sit among us and lighten our darkness england he thought could send teachers for he said england is very rich 
From Trebizond, Mrs. Bishop travelled quickly back to England, and was soon very busy preparing a book with an account of her travels. She found time to speak at many missionary meetings, so anxious was she to plead the cause of the poor people whom she had seen. Her pleasant voice and way of speaking and all the interesting things she had to tell made people eager to hear her, and she spoke also to gatherings of learned men. She was considered one of the greatest of missionary advocates, and an address in which she pleaded for the poor secluded women in eastern lands was printed and sent all over the world. She spoke of the terrible sins of the non-Christian lands in the East, and of the degradation of the women, and said she would give all she had to help them. As usual, when at home, Mrs. Bishop was constantly ill, and only three years passed before she started on another journey. She longed for the East, and wished to visit China and Japan. Whilst she was at home, she had taken lessons in photographing, that she might be able to take better photographs on her travels. She improved immensely, and after this her books were always illustrated by her own beautiful photographs. She first went to Korea, the strange country which lies between China and Japan, and which both those countries desired to possess. At first she did not like Korea, nor its people, but she soon grew to love them, and especially enjoyed the beautiful sunny climate. She wrote that she felt this journey to be more absorbing in its interest than any she had yet had. During the three years that she now spent in the East, she paid three visits to Korea, in order that she might thoroughly study the land and its people. She had a great many hardships to go through in some parts of her journey. Once, after riding for eleven hours under a hot sun, she found the only night's lodging she could get was in a filthy fishing village full of the vilest smells. Her room in the inn was such an awful black hole full of vermin and rats, that when her Chinese servant left her for the night, he said, I hope you won't die. In other places, she was annoyed by the crowds who came to stare at her, never having seen an Englishwoman before. Once her servant had his arm broken by a fall from his horse, and she was obliged to set it herself. He was so touched with her care of him that in spite of his pain he somehow managed to do his work just as usual and said, The foreign woman looked so sorry and touched my arm as if I had been one of her own people. I shall do my best. Between her visits to Korea, Mrs. Bishop went back to Japan and also traveled to China. Her first object was to visit the mission stations in China, and she was much interested in all she saw, especially in the medical missions, and was full of admiration for the missionaries. On a second visit to China, she made a long journey into the interior, going up first by boat on the river Yangtze for 300 miles, and then alone 300 more miles into the country in a carrying chair borne by Chinese, the only way of traveling. Far in the interior, she visited the missionaries of the China Inland Mission, and there she gave money to found a hospital to be called the Henrietta Bird Hospital after her sister. Wherever she went, she photographed, undisturbed by the curious crowds who gathered round her. Once as she was being carried along, the people got so angry because she would not stop her chair to let them have a good look at her, that they threw stones at her, and one hit her a sharp blow on the head, from which she suffered for a long time. In 1897, after an absence of over three years, Mrs. Bishop came back to London. She had accomplished these long and tiring journeys at the age of sixty-six. She brought back with her a beautiful collection of photographs which she had taken, and materials for writing two books, one on Korea and one on her travels in China. She busied herself with writing her books, lecturing about her travels, and speaking at missionary meetings and doing all she could for the cause of missions. She tried to settle down in a house and took first one in London and then one in the country, but never stayed anywhere long, and was as usual always ill as soon as she tried to live in a civilized country. So after a while she went off to Morocco, and there at the age of seventy she traveled through the wild parts of the country, 
riding astride on a superb horse and camping out at night this was her last journey after she got back to england she still lectured and spoke for missions and studied photography she began to plan another journey to china but she fell ill in edinburgh for some months she was confined to bed but still saw her friends and was full of eager interest in everything that happened she was not afraid to die and waited patiently for the end saying that she was going home she died in march nineteen o four at the age of seventy one those who wish to know about her travels and the wonderful things she saw must read her many books which are full of life and adventure and enable us to share her experiences and admire her pluck and energy. End of section 14